Hello, we are live. Here we are in the month of March, and wow, we are almost to the end of the month of March, and to me that's unbelievable because it is flying by this year. And we are studying the vine and the branches tonight. We are in the seventh month, ending the seventh month of our, our The Hour Has Come study. And to me, it has been rich. Every study from the Word is rich. Thank you for joining us tonight, and special thanks to Melissa Davidson tonight. Melissa is local, and she has been with us before. You know, Melissa, I was thinking, have you been here since that bad night when we had the tornadoes, and you were supposed to join me, and it didn't happen? That was the last time that I was supposed to be doing this. Okay, all right. So that was... um, Maybe it was a little bit more than a year ago, or was it? Maybe, I'm not sure. But anyway, we were sad because we had it all planned, and she had done, I think, the study the night before, and then we ended up not even getting to do it here because of the weather. We ended up doing it from my house, and it was hard. You couldn't get there because of the weather, so... No, it was... The weather was right in the middle between us. Yeah, so anyway, I'm glad that it worked tonight. I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for being here. I can always count on Melissa. She's always, um, not that, um, you know, not that, uh, all all the women here are so good. The ones who are in the group are so good to study, but... I'm just thankful for um, the diligent work that you do, not just with Digging Deep, but with your kids. Um, I watch them excel now. Jill, the oldest, is at college this yes. year. How's that going? It's going great. She is a freshman at Freed and is loving it. Good, good. And if anybody's going to making music in a couple of weeks, she's in the show. And oh, good. So, yeah. Good. Now, what club is she, Kaibeta, or is she... Do you I know? forget. She okay. started in one club and then jumped to another, and okay. I just lost track. Okay, that's okay. Um, and we are um, still enjoying. Jeffrey is what year is he? In? Is he a freshman? He's a freshman. Yeah, this is our and, year first. Jill's uh, a college freshman. Jeffrey is a high school freshman, and Joy, Joy is, is in, a, kindergarten. in kindergarten. So all okay. our first years are big things. Okay. Wow. Well, that's neat that they that they're lining up like that. <laughs> Okay, well, we love them all. I especially love to watch what Joy's going to have on because you're like me and you like those little smart things, and I love those. And so I love um, I love the way Sunday she had on the one that buttoned across in the back. That's yeah. one of my favorite patterns ever. So anyway, we are so glad that you're here, and I was in her class last night, I guess our little group, discussion group that she was leading, and I thought, wow, I'm so glad she's going to be here because she has got a handle on it. So very thankful. We are going to go ahead and tell you when the planned podcasts are. This is always, I guess, subject to emergency change, but we are planning on a podcast on April 26th. Kendra Bird is going to do that one with me, so I'm excited about that. She's new to West Huntsville. Yes. Um, May the 17th. Now, notice that one. It's two weeks early, but that was about the best we could do for May. I think Jennifer Crowden from the Chase Park Church is going to do that one with me. And then June 28th and July 26th. And then the next podcast will be at PTP. So we are coming up on the end here, four more, and then the PTP one. So I'll say those one more time, April 26th, May 17th, June 28th, and July 26th. Our um, tech person, Jennifer, is so good to us, and she has a wedding coming up in her family. So we're kind of working around some things, working around some things that I had on the calendar, but we are going to make them happen, Lord willing. So be sure and join us, and we're going to... Let um, Melissa lead us in our prayer, and then we'll get started. Dear God, thank you for this evening that we can come together for this podcast and be able to study your word and share it with women from all over. Uh, Please bless all the women that are taking part of the study, that their, their knowledge of your word will grow and that their faith will grow. And, um that many good things will come from this. Please be with us tonight as we lead this study that will portray or present your word in a clear manner. Please, God, be with those 
who are sick and in need right now. There are many that are mentioned all the time on our Facebook page and other places that are close to our hearts who need you so much. Um, please be with us as we go through this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to remind you as well to invite your friends, not just to join our study right now, although it's a great time to hop in. It's every one of these is a, a pretty much stand on its own kind of topic, so you can jump in anytime, but we will begin a new study September 1st. So be thinking about who you can invite to uh, join us in that study. We have some new people each year, and we have people of different faiths each year who are able to study with us. I think you were mentioning some last night, maybe from another area of the country, but we are um, excited when you are able to invite people who maybe have never really gotten into the Word deeply before. So be thinking about that, and I will, I'm hoping to have the new study written in between this podcast and the next podcast. So pray about that, and we will look forward to continuing on uh, for as long as we can with Digging Deep. So month seven, a conversation about fruit. The verses are John 15, 1 through 8. And if you're there, let's yeah. just go ahead and read that passage. Okay, sure. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. But this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." All right, I love this passage. I was just thinking, you know, when we do get together at Polishing the Pulpit, we may just for our review session just sing because, I mean, there are so many songs that are taken from this yeah. text. And, of course, I am the vine and you are the branches is one of those songs that we I sang since childhood. And we often hear People in the denominational world around us refer to the vine and the denominations are those branches. And we're going to address that in just a minute. But first, Jesus said, I am the true vine. And it's interesting that uh, both Melissa and I came across the same article by um, our late brother that we respect so much, Brother Wayne Jackson. Um, talking about why did Jesus say, I am the true vine? Was that in juxtaposition to some vine that had failed, a failure of another vine? And I asked her to read this quote from Brother Jackson to you. It is interesting that Christ designates himself as the true vine. The Greek term denotes that which is genuine. The word stands in contrast to that which is fictitious, counterfeit, imaginary, simulated or pretentious inasmuch as the israelite nation was portrayed on occasion as a vine by the old testament prophets one can scarcely avoid thinking that this is a rebuke aimed at a considerable segment of the hebrew family the nation largely had failed in its mission and was on the precipice of murdering its messiah right so here we have the jewish vine and it's referred to as a vine several times in the old testament we'll be seeing some of those as we um, discuss this vine tonight, um, I, I was particularly noting 2 Kings chapter 19, in verse 29, it says, This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves in the second year, that which springs of the same. And in the third year, you sow and you reap and you plant vineyards and you eat the fruits thereof. And then he makes it clear here that he's prophesying about the remnant of, that is going to be faithful and is going to be witnessing 
the coming of the Messiah. He says, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again, listen, take root downward. That's a vine taking root downward and bearing fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So I believe this was um, not just a prophecy about the Assyrians being slain, but I believe here we have a reference to the remnant and the um, root that is going to produce the vine in Jerusalem, which of course happened in Acts chapter 2 when the church was born. And we're going to read some more prophecies of that, the establishment of that vine tonight as well. The true vine then, Jesus said, does stand in contrast to the vine that did not avail salvation. It was a vine. It was referred to as a vine several times in the Old Testament. But not only was it a vine that never could bring about salvation, the blood of bulls and goats can't avail salvation, but it was also a vine that was rejecting the Messiah and was, as he said, on the precipice of crucifying the Lord himself. So he said, I am the true vine. And then he says, if a man doesn't abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And then in verse 8, we have our clue as to why this cannot be referring to denominations, but rather individuals. What does verse 8 say? It says, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So tell us why we know, then. Let's make it real clear. How do we know it's not a church? Because disciples are people, not a group, not an organization, not a church. It is the individual. Right. So the idea that Jesus is a vine and there are all these branches that are various denominations is anti-biblical. The very idea of denominationalism, and I think we need to say this over and over because we live in a world that's saturated with the concept that church A can worship a certain way and even prescribe that salvation can be obtained a certain way, and church B can be teaching something dramatically different, even opposite of what church A is teaching, but yet church A and church B are all on the road to heaven in the big church. That is not anywhere in your Bible. I, it would make me happy in some ways if that was in the Bible because there are so many people that I love who are buying into this concept of denominationalism. The very word denomination means a part of. If I say... Um, I have $100, you might say, well, what denominations do you have? And I might say, well, I have, you know, four 20s and two fives and a 10. And those would be the various parts of the whole. So denominationalism, the concept is parts of the whole, and that all of the various churches teaching different things are all a part of the big church. That's not in your New Testament at all. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And he then has um, clearly stated that he who rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him the words that I have spoken. And some of those words we're going to talk about uh, from Matthew 7 For instance, what does Matthew 7, verse 21, let's um, go ahead and turn to Matthew 7. And when we look at there, we see that um, sincerity in whatever church you find yourself, whatever belief you decide to assign to your life is not enough. Now, is, Melissa, is sincerity necessary? Yes, you need to be it sincere. It is faith. necessary. It is a component that is absolutely necessary to salvation. We cannot see Jesus face to face and have eternity with him unless we are sold out, committed 
in our hearts to him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's sincerity. So we have to have sincerity, but it is not the only component. So what does Jesus say in this passage in Matthew 7? Um, I think particularly in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, but if but there in um I want to make sure I'm in the right way. Yeah, I'm get here. I'm one page off. Okay, when we look at that context, um many go ahead and read twenty two. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then, while I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. It's really important to notice here that these are people who thought they were saved. I mean, they're arguing at the judgment day here and saying, but I did this and this and this and this. And I know that, you know, there are many of you here who are, um, listening right now and thinking, yeah, but they thought they were saved by works. It doesn't, let's put that argument aside for a little bit and just know that these people were people who were busy about the master's business during their lifetime. And then when it came time to face the Lord in judgment, they thought that heaven was theirs. And he said, I will profess to them I never knew you. Were they sincere? I'm going to think they were. Yeah. They thought heaven was um, reserved for them. Now, I want us to be clear that there aren't going to be any people who are perfect on earth who find heaven. Right. We're not going to be sinlessly perfect here. But... We have to be searching diligently the word instead of buying into, you know, I, I remember when I was a child, um, we, we loved as kids, you know, this was before you looked at your um, smartphone or your um, Apple Watch to find out the exact time. And if you wanted to know the exact time and if your clocks were fast, there was a number you could call. And I call that number when I was a kid on Sunday morning. I wanted to see if we were late, you know, for worship. And, and on Sunday morning, it said, today is Sunday. Attend the church of your choice. The time is, and then it would give you the time. And we would always talk about how that the church of my choice is not relevant. Right. Because someone paid for the church with his blood, and that was Jesus Christ, thus giving him all authority about the, the way that we worship, about the organization of the church, about the way that we serve him. And that doesn't mean we're going to get it perfectly right, but it does mean that we can know. We can identify his church on earth today. Is it organized as was the New Testament church? So it's, it's very important that we understand that the whole concept of denominationalism, Church A says, do this to be saved. Church B says, to do this to be saved. They can't both be right. They may both be wrong, but they cannot both be right because there is a church described and described in simple enough terms in the New Testament that we can know if we are members of that church. Do we have any comments? Yeah, there's one comment I thought might be good to address. That um, Serena said, well, pointed out that they didn't have all these denominations we have today during that time period when Jesus said this. But I was sitting here thinking about this comment as you were talking that, you know, but there were the Jews who thought they were God's people. And they thought because they descended from Abraham and all that they're given that promise that they thought they were on the right track. And when Jesus came, they not all of them realized that they no longer were, you know? Mm -hmm. And and at the same time, in that verse there, in verse 23 that you just read, it said, you're talking about in that day, I will declare. I mean, he's talking about in the future. He's talking about the end of time. And he knew that these denominations were going to come up too. So I kind of mm -hmm. feel like that even though he, they didn't have those at that time, that it still applies. 
Oh, it definitely still applies. And isn't it a tragedy that we are dealing with? I, I have a really hard time studying the scriptures with anyone today who doesn't have preconceived notions about that come from, let's say, John Calvin or Martin Luther or John Wesley. I, I, there are Charles Wesley. There are um, so many impediments because of the concept of denominationalism that we run into when we try to evangelize. It's very difficult to just take the New Testament and study Christ's words and the words of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And when we do that, uh, and I often say this, if a man took just the New Testament, he had no preconceived notions but he knew he wanted to obey God, and he knew he wanted to be a part of Christianity. He wanted to be a Christian, and he just took this New Testament. When he finished reading it, studying it, would he know enough to be a Catholic? No. No. He wouldn't know anything about so many doctrines of the Catholic. He wouldn't know anything about it. He wouldn't know anything. He wouldn't know enough to be... Um, an adherent of infant baptism. It's not there. Yeah. He wouldn't know he wouldn't know enough to be a Lutheran. He wouldn't know enough to be a Methodist. He wouldn't know enough to be a member of any denomination. And if you ask him when he came out from that deep study of just the New Testament and he said he wanted to be a Christian and you say, what kind of Christian do you want to be? He would look at you with a blank stare, right? Because he would he would say, "I just want to be a Christian. I just want to be a Christian who's following Christ, who is a part of the church." Well, what church? The church. Right. I just want to be a part of the church, and we can still do that today. We can still reject, sincerely reject, the concept of denominationalism and decide. We're going to get in the book. Now, does that mean that we are not going to be a part of any group of people? No, that's not what it means. Because there are other people living today who want to get into the Word and want to be a part of Christ's church. And if you are um, on some distant island and that church doesn't exist, what do you do? Well, then you hope to try to start one. You're going to start it. You're going to go to the New Testament and you're going to appeal to whatever people are around you and say, let's study just the New Testament and let's see if we can be the church of the New Testament. And that is so possible. And I, I know a lot of people make the argument, oh, but Cindy, are you saying that the vast majority of religious people are going to be lost? Well, Jesus said it. Jesus said that Few are there going to be that find it. And all through Scripture, it has been the minority of people who have pleased God. If you really study the Scriptures, you, you see that it is always the minority of people. I believe there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people in heaven. I believe there are going to be throngs of people. And I believe that the Bible teaches that of all nations, of all eras, who have obeyed what the New Testament teaches us to do, besides those people who were faithful to him in the Old Testament. I don't believe there are going to be, you know, somebody said to me the other day, you know, few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And I don't even know if we're going to have that many. Oh, mm, I don't like to hear that. That's not true. We don't have to be perfect people, but we have to be in Christ and doing our best to be a part of the church that's in the New Testament. Do we have any more comments about that? Not yet. All right. So um, the next thing that I, I ask you to do is to write the profession of verse 23 um, on your fridge for the month. And it is sobering. And we have read that. And then we moved into the epistles. And I talked about all of the epistles and how that the concept of denominationalism is absent. 
but the concept of warning us about false teachers who would lead us into such beliefs is certainly not absent. And we took a passage from each of the epistles and talked about how very the objective standard of God's truth was the whole purpose of the letters. And so we read one passage from each letter. Many of them, it was hard to choose because there were, are so many uh, passages that warn us against false teachers. I, I did want us to notice, and we're not going to go through all of these for the, the sake of time, but I did want us to think about the man, Peter, when we're looking at the passages that are the ones in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter 3, if you'll be getting 110 of 2 Peter, I'll read 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. It says, The like figure wherein to baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. I did want us to think about Peter just a minute because we've talked about him so many times on the podcast. We love Peter. What's your favorite thing about the life of Peter? What's your favorite episode? Mm, that's tough, but I know in uh, our co-op class recently, we talked about Peter walking on the water and just what how amazing that is. You know, something that we can never dream of doing with just your bare feet mm. walking on water. You have to have some kind of a boat or float of some sort. And he um, is the only human besides Jesus Christ who's ever walked on water. And we love him and we admire him and we esteem him for that. I think about how that we talked last month about in the upper room when Jesus was washing feet and Peter, Peter didn't feel worthy, and of course he didn't feel worthy. But then Jesus said, but if, if I don't wash you, then you can't have any part of me. And he said, wash, my whole, wash all of me. <laughs> wash not just my feet, but my whole body. He is the one who was outspoken when Jesus said, uh, you know, some say you're Elias, some say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, and... Peter is the one who jumped out and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was Peter who preached that powerful, or it is his words anyway, that I, I think they were probably all preaching. But, but then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. That was on the steps of the temple, likely the very first gospel sermon, the chapter of the Bible that uh, to which all the Old Testament looks and back to which all the New Testament looks, and Peter's right there in the middle of it. We love Peter. But it is Peter who said, don't you be thinking that you can be saved outside of baptism for the remission of sins. He said, the like figure whereunto baptism does also now save us. I think it was Peace at last night that was talking about studies with denominational people and that some people would look at passages like this one and say, wow, I never knew that was in the Bible. Yeah. I've studied this with people who said, that's in the Bible? You're right. Baptism does also now save us. And that's how we get the operation from God that gives us a good conscience, a clean conscience. You know, Peter it says it's the answer of a clean conscience toward God. It's not a clean body that we're getting, but it's a clean conscience toward God. Do you think that he was thinking back about that upper room when Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you're not washed? <laughs> and Peter said, wash all of me then. And, and Jesus at that time in the upper room said, you, you are all clean, but not one of you. And, and they're talking about Judas. I think that this concept of clean here was powerful in the mind of Peter. And I think he might have been thinking back about that. But here he says, baptism does also now save us. Not, not like the washing feet, not like the putting away of that flesh, the filth of that flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. I love Peter. He said, wash all of me. But then he said, 
man. And he said it so plainly. Here's how you here's how you are washed. He said it in Acts 2, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. But then he reviewed it in 1 Peter 3, 21, when he said, baptism does also now save us. I love, I love Peter, but he's making it clear here that there is a directive of how we are washed from our sins. And then in 2 Peter, go ahead and read 2 Peter 1 verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Okay, give diligence is what my version says. To make your calling and your election sure. Wait a minute, Cindy. I didn't think there was anything we could do about our election. Oh, yes. And Peter had just said it in the in the first letter. And then here he says, give diligence to be sure. What? It, how can I give diligence if there's nothing that I can do about it? Well, here he's telling us that we have to examine the word. We have to be in the word and be sure that what we are doing is in accordance with that word. So I just, I, I love Peter and I wanted to point out those verses from First and Second Peter. Then I wanted us to look at, um, it's on page 82 in your book. But which verse in our text of John 15, which verse tells us that we're talking about people here who have already put on Christ? And what did you get for that, Melissa? Uh, that was in verse 3 where he says, you are already clean. You are already clean. That's pretty clear right there that he's talking about people who are already in Christ when he's talking about these branches. Um. Verse 2, it has in me. Verse 4 has in me. Verse 5 has you who abide in me. Verse 6 and 7, you who abide not in me. And verse 8, disciples. You cannot be my disciples. But I think verse 3 is the crystal clear one. Right. And then um, we know that a branch gets severed from the vine and dies. We know that uh, when the gardener burns the dead leaves, he does... Um, that because they cannot bear fruit. And then number six on page 82 says, read Matthew 13 and find a similar analogy. And what's being thrown away in this instance in Matthew 13? So what'd you get for that one? Um, well, that's the tares or the we weeds that were there among the wheat that in the parable that he told there. And what was going to happen to those tares or weeds in the end? They were going to be gathered into... Gathered up and burned. Mm, gathered up into bundles and then thrown in the fire. So gathered up and burned. Um, I then wanted us... Um, are there any... Do we have comments so far? No. No comments. Y'all come on and give us your comments. And um, let's go ahead and look at the word for takeaway... And we're in Romans chapter, no, we're in our original text. The word for takeaway in verse 2 is A-I-R-O, arrow. And from your lexicon, last night we had a lot of different synonyms for this. I have to take up or away, to raise, to expiate, to away with, to loose, to bear away, to elevate. And um, then we're finding the word in John 1. Where did you find that word in John 1? That's in uh, verse 29 where Jesus says, takes away the sins of the world. Okay. So it's interesting that uh, what's going to be taken away in a bad way is the same Greek word that's used for Jesus taking away the sin of the world. I just thought that that was interesting. Um, now let's look at down at number 10. It says there, do a little bit of research in the elementary science department on exactly what a branch receives through the vine in a blueberry bush or a grapevine. So if you're thinking about a grapevine, the vine would be the main stalk. And what's underground that it's connected to? The root. The root. And so what is the root in the analogy necessarily? 
Oh, the, so root you has, off. <laughs> the root has the root to be gone. gone. Yeah. And then Jesus is the vine that connects the branches, which is me, to God. So Jesus is the connector between man and God. And that is everywhere in scripture in all kinds of analogies. But Jesus is that connector. So what does two things simple things doesn't we're not going to be biologists here today and that's a a, um, a common theme this week politically speaking but uh, we're not going to go there but we are um not going to be biologists but we know that from the roots through the vine come two things, and those things are... The nutrients and water. The nutrients and the water. Now, is Jesus providing us the nutrients and the water, spiritually speaking, allegorically speaking, from God? Do we get those things through Jesus? Yes. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the water of life, John 4, 14. Um, he brought us the needed growth nutrients here in our passage in John 15. Um, he is, he provides every, now we could go on and talk about the glucose that is made in photosynthesis and all that, but we're going to keep it simple here and just realize that the, um, Water of life, the nutrition that we need to grow in Christ, and there's a lot about growth in Christ in our New Testaments. All of that we get from deity, from God, but we get it because Jesus came in the flesh, because he came and he died for us, becoming our, and we're going to say some words here that mean he's the vine, he became our advocate. He became our intercessor. He became our mediator. He became the go-between, the legal defense, if you will, for us between God and man. So when we think about the vine, he, he is the middleman between us and God. And there is no, Jesus said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. No man gets what he needs to grow in Christ and to go to heaven, the nutrients and the water of life, and no man can come to the Father except through Jesus. He is the one go-between. Now, um, I'm going to go at the end to Isaiah 55, but just let's just throw out some of those passages, and if you have... Um, I know you have a list of them here, and we made some more of them last night. If you know what they're referring to, like Hebrews 4, 15, and 16 was one that a lot of people got, and I think that's talking about the high priesthood of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is the one who goes into the Holy of Holies for us and represents us to God, makes the sacrifice for us to God. What other passages? Um, one good one was 1 Timothy 2, 5, um, and I didn't put down exactly what each of these was. When I wrote it, I just made a big list. I got it. First Timothy yeah. 2, verse 5. five. Yeah, that one says, um, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So he is God and he is man and he is the only one qualified to connect us to God and be the mediator to provide us salvation. Um, what else? Uh, Romans 5, 1 and 2. And 11. So let's look at Romans 5, 1, 2, and 11. Let me get that. This is talking about through our Lord Jesus Christ, what we that we have, my version says, access. Okay, right. so, so read 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope and the glory of God. Okay, so it says introduction in your version. In mine it says access. We can't access him. We can't be introduced without Jesus. And verse 11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the reconciliation. We cannot be 
And, um, you know, really here, he, um, he was talking to Romans, so a bunch of these people may have been Gentiles. I think it was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles here. But Gentiles had never had access. They had never had the introduction until this time. And it was through Jesus Christ that the Gentiles could be reconciled, could have the atonement or the reconciliation of verse 11. So let's do let's do a couple more. What else did you get? Um, let's see. How about in First Corinthians one four and eleven one? We're both okay. First Corinthians one four. That one says, "I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given you in Jesus Christ." So these okay. some of the verses about. Yeah, and the in Jesus. Christ verses are just um, everywhere in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, in Christ we have redemption, in Christ we have re remission of our sins. Think about the vine and think about what's flowing through the vine from the roots. And um, they're just, I mean, we're just picking, cherry picking here because there mm. are so many passages. Okay, read your next one. Anyway. And then 11.1 1 said, Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Um, we have to be part, we have to go through Christ, be part of Christ to be part of God. And I have second, I'm at it already, so I'll yeah. just read 2 Corinthians 5.18 was one of the ones that was mentioned. All things are of God. That's the root. Who has reconciled us to himself through or by Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Think about that. That's bearing fruit. We are the branch. He gives. He gave the apostles this ministry of reconciliation, so that was the fruit that they bore on the branch, and that fruit was not possible um, without the... And, and Jesus, of course, in John 15, our text, he's talking to the apostles, the apostles were the original branches, and the fruit that they bore was, was the fruit that came from their ministry of reconciliation. They were calling people to God through Christ. And we, now, have, we have okay. a couple of comments. Okay. People just want to share their verses. All right, good. Um, I'll just go ahead and list these if anyone wants to look them up later. Uh, Hebrews 9, 15, and 12, 24. Um, also, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And John 14, 6 were also some other ones. Very good, very good. Um, I think Holly's sending those over from the Facebook page, too. Yeah. So if you're on the Facebook page and you want to add your verse, just go ahead and add it there. I wanted us before we... Uh, 1 John 2, 1. I had put that one. Uh, did we already read that one? I don't, I don't know. Or did someone say that one? But 1 John 2, 1 um, is one that I that jumps out at me, and, and that one says, um, My little children, these things I'm writing to you so that you sin not, and if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world, and we know him if we keep his commandments. So, Advocate, propitiation, reconciliation, mediator, daysman is used sometimes. Um, we have a lot of synonyms and um, adjectives and nouns to describe what Jesus Christ is as the vine that connects the branches to the roots. We can't get what the roots, you know, the roots are, are down in the soil. They're getting those nutrients and they're getting it to the branch. But it can't happen without the vine. And Jesus is the vine. I wanted us to look at Isaiah before we leave this. Isaiah 55. Go ahead and put your verses if you have them and we'll come back to them. But Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 3. It says in, in the King James, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore are you spending money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul will live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So 
Um, here we're talking about um, eating, eating fruit, eating, having the sustenance. We're talking about, um, we've just been talking about sustenance and Jesus is the sustenance. And here this passage clearly says that before Jesus, there was no satisfaction. But with Jesus, the mercies of David, the everlasting covenant of Jesus, um, and we know that this is talking about Jesus. Look at verse 5. Behold, you will call a nation that you know not, that's the Gentiles, and nations that didn't know you will run to you because of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. There wasn't, there wasn't, a com yeah, it was a faulty vine. It wasn't giving what satisfied. But Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel, called the Gentiles in and was able to give the eternal satisfaction and everlasting covenant, verse 3. All right, I wanted to point that passage out. Do we have any more comments about that? Uh, we have one other comment. Uh, Aurora says that her four-year-old asked what the soil would be in question 11. And when they, she says she thought about it and figured that the soil and the roots would both be God in that analogy since the soil is the source of the nutrients. So um, it's all kind of all involved God there to be the source. Okay. All right. We can't, we can't, sometimes we can't really um, take an, an allegory further than the passage takes it because I, we know that the soil is hearts in Matthew 13. We know that the soil was the the different types of soil or the different types of hearts. But here we have the hearts on the branch end. So we can't take an alleg allegory further than, than God really takes it. But, um, you know, the, the soil here... And the roots would have, the soil has the nutrients that are going to go from the roots to us. And so she's right. All of that would, would be God if we were going to carry that allegory further. So um, now thinking about the, the connector between Christ and the fruit. How are we the fruit of Christ as the branches? So we are... As branches, we are the fruit, but then we bear fruit. I mean, the branch is, uh, I'm not, I don't even know if it's good to say the branch is the fruit, but we are, we are Christians, disciples connected to Jesus Christ, and we then bear fruit. And we're going to talk extensively about that fruit in the time that we have left. I want us to quickly think about Amos a little bit. Um, Amos was a shepherd. He was the most common of, of all the prophets, but he wasn't common. He was an amazing prophet. When you um, read from Amos, I love it because I can, under, I can understand everything Amos says. Not that I have a handle on every allegory, but Amos, Amos was blunt, and he told it like it was. He was a shepherd prophet. He identified himself as that. He came from Tekoa, which was 15 miles west, I believe, of the Dead Sea. I have floated in the Dead Sea, so I've been in that region. And he, and he was a shepherd in that desert of Judea. And I've seen that desert. And I've seen shepherds out there with sheep. And they still do wear the, um, many of them still wear the, the headband and the cloth over, over their hair. And they, some of them still wear the robes that uh, we think about an Old Testament shepherd wearing. I, I saw them out on that hillside. Um, but this is not, I, I really appreciated Psalm 23 a lot more when I looked at those shepherds because they're not in green pastures. They're not. They are in craggy hillsides and those they have to look for the sustenance for those sheep. And Amos had come from that hot, craggy desert and then he went up to Bethel. And I've been to Bethel, too. And that's where, you know, Jeroboam first led the people away and built the altars at Dan and Bethel. And um, I, actually, I, I probably was at, at Dan. But that area of um, 
the areas where they built those idols in Jeroboam's day were lush compared to, I mean, they went to some lush areas. Um, Dan was was a lush area compared to that craggy place where Amos came from. So um, he was going to the elite and he was talking to rich people. I mean, he made it clear that he was talking to rich people. And he still put it out there just like the Lord told him to put it. I love Amos. And Amos points out the sins of Israel here. And he's uh, warning them of the captivity that was impending. But he points out specific sins. And um, I'm going to just quickly call out my list. I think mine's longer than yours I because so. I was just, uh, I think I was, maybe I was too picky. But chapter 3, verse 10 is violence and the robbery in the palaces. Verse 14 is the altars of Bethel. That was um, Dan and Bethel where they had built the altars in the days of Jeroboam. Verse 1, the oppression of, of chapter 4, the oppression of the poor and needy, uh, drinking. At chapter 5, verse 7, they turned the judgment, they turned judgment to wormwood. They left off, verse 7, righteousness and mocked justice. Verse 10, they hated him um, who rebuked in the gate. Verse 10, they abhorred him who spoke uprightly. Verse 11, they were treading on the poor. They were taking wheat from the poor. Verse 12, they were afflicting just people. Verse 12, they were taking bribes. Verse 12, they turned poor away from what was their right. Verse 26 is idolatry. Verse 26 is they were making the idols that they were worshiping. And then in chapter 6, verse 1, they trusted in Samaria. Samaria was not the place where they were supposed to be worshiping, but they trusted in the hill of Samaria. Verse 3, um, they put far away the evil day. They didn't like to think about um, the impending justice of God. Verse 3, they brought violence near. Verse, verses 4 to 6, they lived in profligacy, in lewdness, while not caring for the affliction of the people of Joseph. Verse 12, they turned judgment to gall. Verse 12, they turned righteousness to hemlock. They made righteousness poison, so they were taking what was good and making it evil and evil good. Um, verse 13, they claimed victory by their own strength. Chapter 7, verse 9, idolatry again. Verses 12 and 13, the king persecuted God's prophet. In chapter 8, verse 4, they were swallowing up the needy. Verse 5, they were falsifying balances. They were cheating people out of what was rightly theirs. Verse 6, they were taking advantage of the poor. And verse 14, they were swearing by the sin of Samaria. Now, when you look at that basket of ripe fruit, after you list all of those sins, do you think they were ripe for glorifying God or ripe for destruction? And I know everybody got that right. Right. Yeah, they were ripe for destruction. Now, you go ahead and answer for me. Um, where do we find a quote from Amos in Acts chapter 15? This is number right. 16. All right, that's in that's Acts 15, verses 16 and 17 which quotes from Amos 9, 11, and 12. Okay, how do we know that this is talking about the redemption of Jesus? Well, we know it because it's quoted in Acts chapter 15, talking about, what does Acts 15, 16, and 17 say? Acts 15, verses 16 and 17 are quoting from Amos, and what do they say? It says, after these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Now we know that, that those Gentiles, all those who are afar off, Acts 2, that just happened at Pentecost. That was the first call for the Gentiles. And then we have Cornelius being the first Gentile convert in Acts 10 and 11. And so we know that Amos was foretelling the coming of the church and the entrance of the Gentiles into the kingdom. And we know that because of that direct quote in Acts chapter 15. I just love it when 
you, um, you know, so many times I'm, I'm doubtful. I've, I'm, I look at a prophecy and I'll think, um, okay, people are saying that this is about Jesus, or people are saying that this is about the birth of the church, or people are saying that this is about the birth of Christ. But, you know, that's kind of shrouded. doesn't really mean that. But I love it because so many times you look in the New Testament, it tells you exactly what it's talking about. Yeah. And you don't have to doubt that the prophet was looking to the New Testament as he spoke. All right, so I hope you planted your flowering vine. Before we leave tonight, I want us to look at some fruit verses. I just took the time today to look at every verse in the Bible that is about fruit, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I think it's really interesting. The first sin was about fruit. Fruit, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you put me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, the first sin, yeah, I didn't, you knew it. The first sin was about fruit. And the second sin was about fruit. I mean, somebody brought fruit and vegetables, and somebody brought a uh, animal okay, sacrifice. Yeah, Abel brought the animal sacrifice. So we have, you know, and we have fruit being the crux of submission to God all the way back to Genesis 1. And we have fruit in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. In verse 2 of Revelation 22, it says that um, the it talks about the fruit of healing, spiritual healing of the nations. Um, just very interesting. Fruit is a common thread all the way throughout the Bible. So I'm just going to quickly um, show you what I found today. And, of course, any of you could could do this. I just wanted to take the time to do this today. So good fruit. Um, let me punch this up on my, I want to punch these slides up. Okay. Good fruit. Uh, we, we start in Psalm 1 verses 2 and 3. Good fruit is delighting in his law. We're going to take a test here. Just take a little test here and put a check mark. If you delight in the law of the Lord, if you do, you're bearing good fruit. Good fruit is wisdom. Proverb 8, 19. Are you looking for the wisdom that's in God's word? Good fruit is righteousness. And I'm not going to take the time to read all these passages, but are you bearing the fruit of righteousness? And you can look at what these passages say and know whether or not you are. Amos um, is one of those passages again. Good fruit means you're satisfied with good things. That means you don't have to have, uh, not that all forms of entertainment are wrong, not that all forms of pleasure are wrong, but you can be satisfied with good things. You don't have to have worldly things. You can be satisfied with good things. Proverbs 12, 14, Proverbs 13, 2, etc. Honor is a fruit of of uh, is a good fruit if you're connected to jesus christ you're going to be thinking about things that are honorable and honor will be brought to you i think this this one comes from um from the proverbs but we know that one of the fruits of being a virtuous woman in proverb 31 was bringing honor to your family good fruit bears good fruit born involves honor um, it's the it's the payoff for hard work. Do you work hard? If you work hard at honest labor, you're bearing good fruit. Um, next is the church. Your election, you're being chosen as a part of the church by God as um, and we all are chosen if we are a part of his kingdom. It is his chosen kingdom, Isaiah 65 verse 21. That's that's referred to there as good fruit. Are you a part of his church? And let me just pause here to say that if you're not a part of his church, if you haven't been immersed for the remission of your sins, I I'll come to you. I will help you. I would love to do that for anyone who is listening, who wants to be a part of his kingdom, his elect. That's bearing good fruit. Uh, trust. In God, Jeremiah one, Je Jeremiah seventeen verse eight. That's a good fruit. Hope, Jeremiah seventeen verse eight, and Colossians one verse six. 
hope. I, I can't have hope if I'm not connected to the vine. But I'm going to bear the fruit of hope if I'm connected to the vine. Purity from idols is a good fruit. And it doesn't have to be a brazen image. There are all kinds of idols in our world today. But if we're connected to the vine, we're going to not have a part. We're going to be pure from that blight. Sometimes fruit is blighted. Mm -hmm. And then that's when it has to be picked and thrown away. But good fruit is pure from the blight of idolatry. Um, good fruit, Ezekiel 17, 23, is Christ. Am I bearing Christ? Am I? Do I look like Christ to people? You know, good fruit has appeal <laughs> that people look at you and they look at the outside of you and they know because of your choices and because of your words and because of your dedication, you present Christ to them. You bear the fruit of Christ. Goodness is... Um, is a good fruit. Restoration, Joel 2, verse 22, which is the chapter that's quoted so much in Acts chapter 2. Restoration is a good fruit. That means I'm going to be sure that I am a part of res of, um, of reconciliation, and I can't do that without being attached to the vine. And We talked about reconciliation. The kingdom, building up the kingdom and kingdom work, that's good fruit, and the passages are there. Glory to God is good fruit. If I am connected to the vine, I'm going to glorify God in the deeds that I do. We're about to get to the ones that we all recognize as good fruit. Commandment keeping, John 12, 24, Romans 7, verse 4. Saved people. I'm going to, people are going to be in heaven if I'm connected to the vine. I'm going to influence other people to be in heaven. I'm going to. I can't imagine being a Christian without constantly trying to reach other people. And we've talked about that. We talked about that some last night. We're people, if we are connected to the vine, we're going to be influencing other people to be connected to the vine. Um, benevolence is a fruit of uh, that's going to be born when we are connected to to the vine, holiness, being set apart from the world for the purposes of New Testament Christianity. Life is a fruit that's born when we're connected to the vine. Love is one of those fruits that we have. Now, this, this next list here, you were you were singing that song last night. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Those oh. are <laughs> the ones that are connect yeah. us to the vine, and they are? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right. Um, and we've stated some of those already, so I moved some of those to um, a, a different part of the list because we had already stated it. But um, patience may be in your version, long-suffering, but those are fruits of the Spirit. But the Spirit is the Word, and that's the nutrition that comes through the vine. And so that is good fruit. And then Galatians 5.22, um, I mean Ephesians 5 verse 9, truth is a good fruit. Faith, Colossians 1.16, is a good fruit. Grace, Colossians 1.6, I said 16, but I meant 6. Praise, we're going to, praise is a good fruit. We're going to be praising him, not just you know, we think about praise sometimes when we think about singing, but we're going to be praising God. If we are connected to the vine, we are going to be talking about it to our fellow Christians and to people who are not Christians. Spiritual healing, we talked about that one from Revelation 22, verse 2. So we've gone. Uh, now, I, these are not all the passages that have about fruit because a lot of the passages about fruit are about... Cain brought the fruit of the field or, um, you know, fruit uh, that when we're talking about the year of Jubilee, you're not going to bring any fruit into your, you know, and here will I put my, here will I gather my fruits, the rich man said. You know, the fruit is everywhere, but these are the ones that identify the fruit in an allegorical, spiritual sense, and those are, that is a pretty exhaustive list of that. Now, the bad fruit. And then we'll take your comments, and then we'll pray, and we'll be done. A failure to listen to God. That's a bad fruit. And these remember, all this 
is going to be burned up. This is no good. And the branches that are bearing this fruit are going to be cut off and burned up. So um, the failure to listen to God, sin, that's a general one that's everywhere. Self-glory is a bad fruit. Do you know, I know some people that really want to guard against this. I know some people that are just all about themselves all the time. It's just how can I present myself to um, to not reflect Christ, but how can I make people like me? How can I be important? How can I, when I walk in the room, everyone look at me? Self-glory is a fruit that is that we don't want to bear. Oppression of the weak or needy, that's everywhere in the Old Testament. We want to be very careful that we do not oppress the weak and needy. Drunkenness. Isaiah 28, 4, covetousness, Isaiah 57, 19, lewdness, Jeremiah eleven sixteen, And that you might have a different version. It might say something else. Profligacy. Um, it is living with abandonment, not caring um, that I'm walking in the ways of the Lord, but I I'm, I'm here to have a good time. And that is a a bad fruit that will be cast away. Um, shame, Ezekiel 17, 8 and 9. Idolatry. And then, of course, if we're pure from idolatry, it's the good fruit. So here, idolatrous is the bad fruit. Impenitence. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you could have any fruit that's more rotten than impenitence because that is, that is the ultimate sin. Anything we can fix, but we can't fix impenitence. If we are not going to repent, we cannot be saved. False teaching, we talked a lot about that. Corruption and death. Death is a fruit of that is um, born of a branch that is not getting the nutrients from God himself. So that was interesting. I just thought that that was a fun um, experiment. And it is interesting, too, that there were 32 descriptions of fruit that's good but you know there are multiple passages so I didn't count the passages for good fruit and bad fruit but um there were 20 uh, in you know and this is subjective uh, how you name these but 32 I got of the good fruit and 18 of the bad fruit so and several have asked, some have asked um can we get this posted on the Digging Deep page? So we'll see, yeah, I'll get it posted. We'll share it Jen somewhere. Jen already said she would put the slides up. I originally had these as slides, and I think she's going to put those up so that you can access so those later. If you want to go back on those, we'll have okay. those. Let's um, show this picture of this fig tree here. Um, read Matthew 13, 22. Um, and this, this tree here, and you can go just Google strangler fig or strangler tree. And it is such a phenomenon. And last night when we were talking about it in our little discussion group here, we talked about um, how that these strangler trees are common in Australia. But there are strangler trees in Florida. I just mm -hmm. I, I was looking at that today. And there are some strangler trees in Florida. But this is the strangler fig tree here that you're seeing. And it was common it is common in Australia, and what it is is if you don't cut this choking vine back when it's a baby choking vine, it gets this big tree, and it kills a huge big tree and just takes it over. And what a spiritual application is there? Go ahead and read Matthew. Yeah. And, and the one on whom seed was, seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You know, it almost, when I look at this picture of this fig tree, it almost makes it hard for me to breathe because I think, oh, no, this, this is the epitome of Matthew 13, 22, this, this, you can see these big branches. They started out small and that's how sin does. It starts out small in our lives, but if we don't battle it, if we don't cut it off and cast it into the fire, 
then it overtakes us. And pretty soon what's inside of us that was good and that was of the Spirit and that was connected to the roots, which is God, pretty soon that's dead. And what's living is this choking, horrible, damning death vine that has choked out what was good in us. I just think that this tree right here, I may talk about this this weekend in my ladies' day because it's um, the ladies' day this weekend's in Johnson City, and it's about shaping women to be what God wants us to be, to be women of purpose. And, you know, there was something good inside of here, but it just was, somebody was negligent here to cut down what was going to eventually choke out the good. Well, I'm, I'm just telling you, when you start anticipating the choking out of the vine that gives you your nutrients and your water that is that is from God, and really, this is what we know of Jesus. I mean, what he said was, He who rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him, the word that I've spoken. What's going to judge us is right here. And if we let this get choked out by the cares of this world, by the strangler vine, so that we no longer are getting, it's choking out the nutrients that we need to be getting from this, then we are in, in spiritual danger. So it was a good study. It was. I enjoyed it. I'm so thankful for your preparation. I know it was intense, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Do we have any more comments? I think that was about it. All right. So y'all look up the strangler tree now and take it to heart. And don't let the tares, the weeds, and especially not that strangler fig, get into your spiritual lives. All right, we're ready to pray. Join us next time, which will be April 26th. Is that right? April, is that what we said? Let me look real quick. The next one. Oh, oh. We may just, um, we may just do it an hour early or something. It, I, I think we're conflicting with our gospel meeting. But I thought that was a weekend meeting, no? That goes from Sunday to Wednesday. Okay, this is Hiram Kemp, and you don't want to miss him. So um, we may, you know, I could just get him to preach on whatever we need, <laughs> and we could just go ahead and live stream that for the podcast. We will let you know about the April podcast because we just uh, just realized that I did not have that gospel meeting marked, and so I, I don't know why, but I messed up. So we will figure out what we're going to do about the podcast, and we will let you know quickly on the Dig and Deep page. Sounds good. All right, let's, let's pray. Father, you are our roots. You are that in which we are grounded. You are the source of every good thing in our lives, every good and perfect gift. Most of all, you are the source of our spiritual sustenance, our life, our ability to bear fruit. And we are thankful that we are connected to you through the true vine, the true vine, Jesus Christ. We are thankful that he is our, and we could say so many nouns here, our mediator, our advocate, our daysman, our propitiation, our reconciliation. We are so very thankful that he is our high priest. He is the Holy One of Israel who has given us, as Gentiles, the connection that we need to have everlasting life. We are thankful that we, as unworthy, unconnected people, are now connected in a covenant, in an unbreakable covenant with, with you, Jehovah God, through Jesus Christ. It is unbreakable for, from outside forces. The devil can't take it away from us. Only we can choose to be separated from that covenant. And we pray 
that we never will choose that. Father, we want to pray for those who are suffering right now. We know that there are diggers all over the world who are suffering. There's one that right here in our midst, Carol Dodd, who has been a faithful digger since, um, I, I believe, almost since the beginning of Digging Deep. And, and we know, Father, that she is in her last days and weeks on this earth. But it is the beginning of something wonderful and, and everlastingly good. And we know that she's looking forward. She's anticipating that. But we pray for those people who will find it so hard to, um, to do without her. They will find the loss here so very hard. And, and I'm one of those people. And there are people all around us who, who are of that number. We pray for her that um, that she will, when the time comes, have a peaceful hour in which to die, and that she will have a great faith as the angels bear her away. Father, we are so thankful for the reality that is the, the goodness of the blessedness of dying in the Lord. We know that your scriptures give us that, and we um, we want to praise you for that. We want to talk about that and praise you for that, and we are thankful for that. Father, there are children in our worlds tonight who are suffering at the hand, hands of people who are influencing them in difficult and dangerous directions. Not um, not just one or two, but many, Father, that we know about who are being influenced by people who are, are not influencing them in good directions. Many are in our school systems, and many are being influenced by wicked peer groups and many of our young people are being influenced by the media. It's a dangerous world in which we are bringing up our children and we pray that you will help us to be branches that are connected to the true vine and that we will give the sustenance to our children and our grandchildren and that we will bear fruit through their lives, Father. Help us against all odds to be able to do this, Father. Help us to defeat the devil in the lives of the young people around us. We pray diligently for them. Father, we pray that you will give us strength and courage in times that are difficult for Christians. And we pray that you will help us to have wisdom in dealing with the situations that are so difficult for us on many fronts. We are thankful for every digger. And we know that there are diggers that are in you. And we know that there are some who are outside of Christ. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to be never proud because we are in Christ, but always humbled by the fact that Jesus would take even me and let me be a grafted branch and let me be one of his chosen and let me bear fruit in his kingdom. What a privilege that is. And we are so thankful for the high price that was paid Help us not to let the blood be wasted on us, but help us to be cleansed by it and to be ready to look into the face of our Savior Jesus Christ one day in glory and help us to bring the people that we love with us. It's in his name that we beg of you this. Amen.